So another of the allegations against Keith I wanted to ask you about is that within this DOS group, this women's group, there was an extreme focus on dieting and calorie counting, uh, allegations that Allison Mack, for example, got, you know, skeletally thin and said that Keith was restricting her calories and stuff. What do you have? What, what's up with all that? What's up with the calorie counting and you having to text other women in the DOS group and say, master, may I eat now? Or like, what was so with all that? Not everyone in DOS counted calories. So I think that's just like one thing to, to point out is that what's happened in the narrative is one person's experience has become what everyone did in DOS. And it's just not true. Um, not only did every person work with, you know, the people they invited and, you know, mentor, not only did they like, everyone's different. Everyone has different styles, different types of relationships. And also people have different goals. To the best of my knowledge, the people who counted calories had expressed that it was something they wanted to work on. For example, I see, saw an email from India to Keith saying, can you help me lose weight? And I don't think counting calories are bad. I, I actually think it's a very good tool if you want to understand how to take control of, you know, not only your body, but also your emotional impulses. I, I think everyone has the right to be whatever weight they want. And I also think it's, you know, it's about measurement. It's about discipline. It's about doing what you say. So it can actually, calories are just like a very easy thing. To, to use as a, a discipline that once you work through your emotional issues with sticking to a program like that, it can help you in all areas of your life. One of the last allegations I want to mention, and that's the one that's gotten, it's gotten a lot of hype. And so just, just to, for me to briefly explain what that's referring to. So in this small women's group, this DOS group, women would get basically a kind of a tattoo, except it would be a brand. And uh, it was not like the cattle brand or whatever. It was a medical tool administered by a nurse. Yes, someone with nurse training. So the person who did the did the brand for some people, not not um, others. Oh, it was not uh, every woman. It was not was, all the women in DOS that got it. No. How well, many women got it? Uh, I think I think twenty three total. Tw just women twenty. Got just twenty three got this. Twenty three got got the brand and. What's important to note is that knowing about the brand was a prerequisite to joining DOS. So the part of the, the process of, of joining was women were told basically all the, the most important details and things that might be, um, I don't know, met, met with uh, resistance those things were all laid out ahead of time and, and a known part of joining. So this idea that like, oh, suddenly they were branded, like it's just, mm. it's just not how so it So you're happened. saying that when a woman would be asked to, first of all, she would have, first of all, she'd be told there's this thing that she could do, but if she mm -hmm. wants to learn about it, she needs to provide some collateral. Mm -hmm. Talked about that. She provides the collateral uh, and willingly. Then, exactly. And then she is told more about this group and that if she, and that if she joins, she has to get this mark or this, this yeah. medical cauterized brand. Yes, exactly. Okay. And then they have to agree to that. There's no pressure. There's no force. Will their collateral be released if no. they're, if they don't get a brand? No. Okay. No. So again, like all of those facts are missing and it's very convenient for someone who what was I the think, purpose of the brand? Sorry. What was the purpose yeah. and who thought it up? I think it was, I mean, we had a lot of meetings in the beginning talking about, you know, what this is going to be, how to make it meaningful, different experience to kind of like solidify the commitment. Um, and getting a brand was part of that. We talked about tattoos, but how you can remove them and, and brands. I, I don't know how the pain compares to a tattoo because I don't, have one, but it uh, it's like barely visible once it once it heals. They kept saying in the documentary too. This is what I didn't like as well. This is a red flag for me. 
again, I'm not condoning the brand or saying that was okay or whatever, but like, but they kept saying, and they, they, they got this brand on their vaginas. And I was like a brand like, on your do vagina. Do you know anatomy? Whoa. Well, yeah. Maybe. To me, I don't know if it seems like it a was, vagina. Yeah. So it was actually, it was a small medically cauterized brand that was on the thigh or where was it precisely? Hip. Two things I want to say. First of all, I, I appreciate that you're, you're making the distinction between uh, a cattle brand you know, which, which was part of the narrative branded like cattle, please. And they were held down too, which, which by the way, when you look into that more deeply, it, when they said they were held down, it makes you think that, that it was involuntary, but what was actually going on is the women were voluntarily agreeing to this, but actually directing didn't... people. If you, if you watch what? Sarah's video, she's bossing everyone around saying, hold me here. Okay. And I want to hold you like another thing just to add to that is that Sarah got the brand in January. And after that, she enrolled two, maybe three more people into DOS under her. So you're saying that basically she was instrumental in other I'm... women getting the brand, right? <laughs> well, I don't think they ever got the brand, but also like, I think she was fine with it yeah. until it became a problem with Nithi. Uh, I see. I see. Her husband. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so again, I mean... It's, it's so difficult because on the one hand, I have no problem talking about why I've made the choices I've made and, you know, who I am as a person, but I know that none of these questions would even exist if this were men. And something that, that you bring up that, that strikes me too, uh, is that, I, you know, I've talked before on my show about how I do, I get a lot of skincare procedures done. I'm, I love skincare. I get a lot of laser stuff done and those lasers are are they hurt I mean I've been in the chair before where I needed someone to hold me down <laughs> in the laser chair and I'm crying yeah. and there's some laser procedures that actually cut the skin open and then it wow. you can actually see the skin like coming apart and then coming back together and like but my point is we allow people to carve up their bodies in all kinds of ways that they want to and you know mm -hmm. talk about we get into the trans issue we're not going to get into that right but I mean it, elective surgery yeah. all of these things yeah BDSM relationships where there's cutting and stuff going on. And I don't, and I'm not saying all of these things are great or good. Right. And I'm not saying that what you're, you know, honestly, the, the branding stuff in your group sounds nutty to me, but I don't get to decide. It's not up to me what people want to consensually do. The question is, was this consensual or was it not? And can it be proven that it was not consensual? It wasn't proven. And also that wasn't part of any charge. You've said that the government's case is corrupt, that the government has done corrupt things. We already talked about one example of, uh, of, use, of weaponizing this photo that you say is contested. Uh, what else has the government done? You said, or what, how, how has the justice system been exploited in this case? Mm -hmm. So when I found out that there was this in investigation, and actually, um, I think... Catherine talks about it in, in the vow, how she was telling India the FBI is involved, but she was lying. So like I, I had heard that from India, like the FBI is investigating, but that that seemed insane to me. So I, I didn't believe it until federales in Mexico came and took Keith away. Mm -hmm. um, and I read the indictment and I was like, this is this is ridiculous. This is so easily uh, disprovable. Like, I, this is so easy to show. This isn't what we're doing. Um, I can't wait. I literally said to someone, and I, I think it's like on a recording somewhere, I can't wait to talk to the FBI because they're going to see how these people are lying. And... I don't know, I guess it's sort of like a, a loss of innocence <laughs> that I went through of realizing that once they, once the government has committed to a narrative, especially at the height of Me Too, they, they got this big guy, you know, this, this abuser. And, um, you know, they put all these resources into into this case, um, they weren't interested in, in the truth. And I know that for several reasons. Um, I didn't end up going in and speaking to them. I had a lawyer who advised me against it, and I'm very grateful for that because I think once 
once they kind of like have a little bit, that's once when they, they start... smell the blood, once they smell the exactly. blood. Exactly. This, this case was career making for, for the lead prosecutor. Ton of press. Because initially the I mean, government was not going to, initially this was not going to be pursued. They went to the authorities. The authorities said, sorry, this looks consensual. We can't do anything. And then they went on a press tour and publicly lobbying the attorney general. Yeah. So there's, again, it's, it's been such an education. I, my mom probably wishes I, I went to law school instead of learning this way, but, uh, you know, it takes what it takes. I, um, I was asked to come in, like I said, to, to speak to um, the FBI and the prosecutors, but I, I, I held out. I, I decided not to. I really, I really believed there was nothing. I mean, they threatened me. They said, if you don't come in, like they'd said things to my lawyer, we have this evidence, we have that, you know, your client this. And I just knew it wasn't true. Like I knew those things didn't exist. So I, I made that choice and I'm, and I, and I think it's why I'm able to sit here and have this conversation with you. I also have friends who were actually brought into DOS by Allison. So they were in the exact same position as India and Nicole, who was the, the main um, witness victim at trial which is interesting. Again, like the exact same situation, relationship, same type of things went on, but they're not testifying at trial. But I think the prosecution wanted to get them to believe that they were victims. And what Michelle and Danielle have expressed is that they were basically just bullied for hours and threatened to to try to make them believe that they were victims, that they didn't make choices, that they didn't know what they were doing, that Keith had bad intent, that Allison was mean to them. And that just wasn't their experience. And I think, you know, I, I think it's relevant to look at, you know, who the different people are, what their life experiences are, because I, I honestly believe that in a different life, if I didn't have kind of like maybe the upbringing I did or the, the education that I have, that maybe I would have believed it. Like, I, and that's why I do, I do have empathy for the people who are, are victims in this case. I wholeheartedly disagree with choices they've made and the destruction they've caused, but I can understand it because it's very scary to go up against the federal government. I have been through hell. And I don't think everyone wants that. And I, I understand that and, and it's okay, but I, I also think it's wrong and, and it needs to be exposed. Well, again, it was, it was interesting to me that Sarah Edmondson, one of the main figures in the vow and, um, and one of the main now now critics of the organization that she was in. It's interesting to me that uh, that in the Val, her her initial reaction once she sees that things are exposed and start, starting to crumble, that that the, the DOS group is exposed, and that now there's going to be all this negative attention. When she says, "How do I avoid jail for four years?" So the reason for that, it actually had nothing to do with DOS. She was being investigated by the Vancouver Police Department because once shit started to hit the fan. Reports say that she had people go into the admin system and start deleting debts, deleting debts of people in the Vancouver center who were under her. And what do you mean debts? Uh, monies people owed the company for oh. trainings or okay, gotcha. future, the financial future records. classes. Exactly. And you can see, I've, I've seen the reports, like there's certain people that suddenly their, their debts become gone. And another piece of information that, you know, isn't, it hasn't been shared anywhere is that Sarah very much always wanted to bring people in what, even if they didn't have money, she had a lot of like actors at, at the center there who were, who were struggling or aspiring. So she had all these different agreements with people where she would pay it on her Amex and they would 
work it off or pay her back over time. Are you talking about forced labor? I'm I know, no, I know. I'm saying it sounds, I see, I see. It would look very bad for her. She was the sole, well, actually, I think Mark and her were technically the owners of the Vancouver Center, but she was the one who operated it. And she made hundreds of thousands of dollars off of everyone she enrolled and everyone who came through the doors of that center. She made thousands of dollars off of me. Mm -hmm. Like she's the one who brought me into the organization. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and Mark as well, because Mark brought Sarah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think she was looking for a way out and, and without experiencing any consequences, particularly financially, as well as reputational. Right. This is an obvious question, but do you have anyone on your side other than former members of your group? Uh, and, and if not, why is it so hard to get people to pay attention, anyone to pay attention to this? Well, I think there, there's, there's two parts. There's people paying attention and there's, there's supporters. I have a lot of supporters. I'm very fortunate with the small platform that I have. I think I have the most followers on Twitter. Um, you know, I have a lot of people who send me DMs of support, people that I've become close friends with because they've seen through the, the narrative and they've, um, you know, had a great amount of respect for how I'm handling things. And, you know, very, various people who, who support me, some people publicly, but, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's, mm-hmm. it's difficult, um, especially since the media was so complicit with the narrative to begin with. And, you know, just like prosecutors and people, you know, in government, no one wants to admit they're wrong. Media doesn't want to admit they were ever wrong either. Not to mention, you know, the salacious narrative sells way better than, well, actually it's a lot more nuanced and they were trying to help each other grow. And maybe it was a little edgy for some people or it got complicated and outside forces tried to paint it a certain way. People got scared. Like it, that's not gonna sell newspapers. So the question for me and what I haven't resolved in my mind is are we, where on the spectrum is this group? Is this group more on the disturbing end of the spectrum, or is it more on the end of, well, this may not be what I would choose for my life, but you know, other people want to whatever, right. Free choice. And so I'm trying to kind of figure out in my mind where this, where this group is on the spectrum, but it sounds like what, what your perspective is, is that this group is not over here with the Jim Jones and the Charles Mansons and all that stuff that where, where, where murders occurred. Yeah. Like, right. People died. Right. <laughs> right. I think it's right. important to point yeah, out. No, like, absolutely. Like call it what you want, but they killed people. Right. We're trying to determine here is, is was there a legal activity? Was there abusive activity? And it sounds like what you're claiming is that no, there was not. Right. Correct. I think that a number of viewers will be interested to know how briefly, how you got into this. So how did you meet Keith? How did you learn about this organization? How did you get into it? So I was an actor in, in Vancouver. And at the time, working on a a pretty successful television series, Battlestar Galactica, I was doing really well. At the same time, I was taking university classes because I, you know, I have always been someone who who cares about learning and understanding myself as well as, as the world better. So I studied philosophy, religion, psychology, all that fun stuff. And, um, at the same time, I wasn't feeling like I was really, um, this sounds so lame, but like realizing my potential, if you will. <laughs> like I had like a lot of ideas, you know, I, I would have amazing deep conversations with friends, but in my life, I didn't feel like I was really kind of um, right. doing and experiencing what what I imagined I could. And Sarah, Sarah Edmondson, who, who's star of The Vow, um, was someone in my kind of like social group because she was also an actor in Vancouver and she started this um, women's group that got together once a week that, um, you know, was really nice because I didn't have a lot of women friends, but it was nice to, that she kind of organized that. But I didn't know her super well. And, and my experience of her was that she was not really into deeper things. 
and you know, so our, our relationship was fairly super, superficial. And then she came back from this course. Like she went to Albany, she met the director of What the Bleep, she had this experience and she was um, really moved and inspired by it. She's the type of person, as you can tell, like once, if she likes something or if she hates something, mm-hmm. she gets everyone. So mm-hmm. yeah, so she, we went out after she'd come back from this training and she told me about it. And I wasn't necessarily looking for something like that. I hadn't done kind of like any type of personal growth courses. It was all more kind of like academic, Mm -hmm. Um, but she was different. She was a lot more thoughtful, um, present with me, like not just talking about herself, like she was asking me Mm -hmm. questions and I was Mm -hmm. like, Hmm, like maybe there's something to this. And I, I mean, I didn't, I wouldn't say like I jumped, I was like, Oh my God. Yes. I I was like, what do I have to lose? Like Mm -hmm. if it's as great as she says, then that, then that's great. If it's not, then I, you know, I waste five days and some money. Right. So then I went to New York, I took the course, I really liked it. Um, I thought the, you know, there were things that were weird to me, but the education and the shifts that I had um, during, during that training were really profound and and helped me um, both in my acting career and in my relationships. So I just, you know, I, I wanted to, to know more, to learn more. I ended up becoming a coach because I thought being able to help people in that way was really beautiful and meaningful to me. And that's kind of how it, how it started. Uh, and how did you meet Keith and how long, how long did you know him before you got into a sexual romantic relationship with him? Gosh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I think uh, I met Keith at the first, like one of the first trainings that I took because at that time he would, um, when there was a training going on, he would come in and like do a forum or just come in to like meet people. Uh, I think in the vow, it shows Keith teaching. And like, that was a pretty rare thing, Mm. even back then. Uh, When there was new, like, I think most of those videos that look a little more recent are actually not from ESP. They're from uh, SOP, the, the men's organization. Mm -hmm. because um, everything else he didn't teach. But sometimes he would come in and do what are called forums where just like anybody could ask him about anything, like Mm -hmm. about time travel or like how to, you know, uh, discipline their children in a compassionate way, like like anything. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I think I met him at a training then. And I was just, I was really impressed with his mind and what he had created. And um, yeah, over time we started to communicate and, and I expressed that I, I really wanted to evolve as, as a human. I really wanted to work through issues that, it, that had kind of um, become more apparent to me through, through the education and it just kind of evolved over time. So I don't know the exact. He, did he pressure you uh, into getting into an intimate relationship with him or was that presented to you as if you didn't do this, there'd be any consequences or anything like that? I think that's such a, an interesting question. I want, I want to just say no, of course. Um, and I wonder like in, if, if I was a man and there was a, a woman that I you know, that I ended up being with who maybe was in like, a, you know, the, the CEO of a company or, or whatever, mm-hmm. like, would we ever ask, well, did you feel pressured? Like, did, mm-hmm. did you feel like there was going to be consequences? Like, I was an adult. I had had several long-term relationships. I, I made my own choices. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's a long time ago, so I can't tell you like every single thought I had, but like, I, I chose what I chose because I, I wanted it and I continued to want it over time. And I never felt like I didn't have a choice. And one point that I think is important to point out is that Mark, Sarah, 
and a number of other people. I think it started out with 80 and it's, it's less now are in a civil lawsuit suing the Brofman sisters as well as, um, and, and they, the Brofman sisters are Edgar. Worth Brofman hundreds Sanger's of millions daughter. of dollars. Yes. Yeah. I don't know their exact worth, but I think that was something that stood out to me in the vow as well, that Kristen Keefe, when she's on the phone with Sarah, she says, there's a lot of money in this, Sarah. They, Claire just inherited $250 million, mm-hmm. which why, you know, what, what does that even matter if at that point, but what happened was Kristen then introduced Sarah, who then enrolled a whole bunch of people, because that's what she does. She She's a salesperson into joining this civil action lawsuit. And I am actually defendant. So Sarah and Mark, who brought me in, who profited off of every course that I ever took and encouraged me to continue taking courses over the years, which I'm not mad about, obviously, Mm -hmm. because it was my choice. And, Mm -hmm. you know, but the fact that they're suing me is so outrageous. And I think just points to the absurdity of this entire case. And I think the fact that they're going for money at this point is, um, it makes their motivation questionable. Okay, so one of the things that that people are saying about the vow too, and I haven't seen the next season; it's not out quite yet, um, is that it goes more deeply into some of the you know quote terrible things or atrocities that were committed by this group. And we've already talked about, I think, the main points, but there is one thing that I wanted to go over. So the organization is accused, and Keith is accused of basically contributing to a uh, girl being imprisoned in her room for over a year. Can you tell me, can you tell me what, what that's about? Yeah. I think she might've been 21, was maybe 20. Okay. Um, so this was, um, a woman who, whose family, uh, her, her mother and father had brought, um, her and her brother and sisters to Albany because they really loved the curriculum their uh, well-off family in Mexico. And this woman started stealing. She's very smart, very, very intelligent, um, but has maybe some other issues. She started stealing from the company and she started doing things that were destructive, not only to her, but to, to other people, like going into people's houses and taking things. And the parents were like, we don't know what to do. We feel badly. We feel responsible. And they sought guidance from Keith. And because, wait a minute. I'm sorry. So because of the way it's being presented in, in at least descriptions that I've read is that it was because she was dating someone that Keith was jealous of and that he was trying to stop that. But you're saying that's not the situation? No. Okay. She did also have a relationship with Keith. Mm -hmm. I don't know the details of it, but again, my understanding is that she was lying about things Mm -hmm. and that was a problem. And so the parents sought guidance from Keith and he, he, again, I wasn't there. I think Mm -hmm. I, I like, I heard about these things happening at the time, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't as involved. So I'm only sharing what, what I think is believed to be true based on talking to people who were part of it before it ever became a you know, a sensational story, not to mention a part of a criminal case. And so her, her like task, so to speak, or her punishment, if you want to call it that was she needed to create a plan to fix the things that she'd done and do, she had committed to doing like a book report for Keith. And so she needed to go in her bedroom, which is like a bedroom in a suburban home, uh, and stay in there until she did it, until she made a plan to fix things and and completed the thing that she said she would do to show that she was ready to like take on responsibilities and be able to be trusted again. And it became a, a power struggle. She basically stayed in the room in an unlocked suburban bedroom, was waited on hand and foot by her family who brought her organic meal, vegetarian meals and got her anything she wanted. And she stayed in there for like 18 months. 
because she wouldn't do the thing that she said she would. And she could have left physically. She did sneak out at different times. She got whatever she wanted that she asked for. So I'm not saying it's not weird. I'm not saying, I don't Mm -hmm. know that her parent, it was the right way for her parents to handle the situation, but it's not what is being described. So you're saying an adult woman was living with her parents and was causing problems and they, and Keith advised that she needed to stay in her room and complete this project and she wouldn't complete it, but she was not imprisoned, imprisoned in the room. She, she was just staying there. The door was unlocked. The door was unlocked. And she left sometimes is what you're saying. And she snuck out. Yeah. There were apparently a few times she snuck out and she could have left. She either could have left going against the agreement or she could have just done the thing she was told to do. But I think she, it became like, you know, she doubled down. But she was not being, but she was not being physically held there is what you're saying? No. Like forced to stay there? No, no. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, it's not one of those things that, it's not one of those things that makes sense or that sounds, uh, sounds great. Um, no. But does, it doesn't qualify as forced and imprisoning. No. Um, okay. So I appreciate you talking to me. I wanted to, to kind of end with a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, I wanted to hear you say, what do you think are Keith's weaknesses or what mistakes did he make? Looking back on it, you know, what, what responsibility does he have for the way things have turned out? I don't want to speak for Keith because I think that there are a lot of things that I'm sure he has reflected on and things that he's expressed to me and some that he's expressed publicly that he either regrets or or were blind spots and things he feels remorseful for. However, it's a very difficult situation and, and line to walk because I feel like this man is sitting in prison. He's being tortured. He's being deprived of his legal rights, communication with his attorney. All of his friends have been banned from seeing him and communicating. And yet there's no proof of these crimes. It's all just in this, in this haze of hate. And I understand why, why you're asking the question, like, what are his weaknesses, you know? And look, he's a human being. He has many flaws, as we all do. But none of those things justify what's happened to him and and the situation he's in. And I think, you know, either people are looking for a reason to make him bad or justify how he got himself there, or they're testing whether I am brainwashed or I'm stupid and like, I don't see, you know, him for his humanity. And that's just not true. You know, you mentioned before, like Keith was this charismatic leader and this guru type. I never saw him that way. He's a friend. He's someone that I I built a really meaningful relationship over time and that we had wonderful conversations and experiences together. I I respect the work he did tremendously, but I, I never felt like, I don't know, maybe it's because I was in Hollywood and I've, I've like spent a lot of time around famous people and I just... I know they're just people and I know everyone has a struggle no matter how much success you have or how little success you have. So I know that doesn't answer the question, but I think it's important um, to acknowledge that because Keith is a human and, and he has weaknesses. He has, he has flaws and I, you know, I could sit here and like write a list, but considering the circumstances, I don't, I don't feel like it's really relevant. Well, I guess what I was trying, what I'm trying to determine is a, is if you are able to clear-sightedly pinpoint at least one failure of his, maybe not something illegal or, or blaming it all on him, but one failure. I mean, he was the head of this organization and now it's gone to shit. So, yeah, I mean, that's a yeah. huge <laughs> failure. Like, <laughs> yeah. like I could, uh, that's the thing. I could point to many failures. He well, could had, you point to I one? Mean, could you point to one? He didn't always have, um, and still maybe, although I think maybe he is more in reality, but like, I, I think he, 
maybe didn't really understand um, where the world is at. Like a lot of his ideas are very, very lofty mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they require a certain level of, of either intelligence or self-awareness or just willingness to go against social norms or, mm -hmm. you know, be fearless in, in mm -hmm. things. And that's just not the world we live in. Mm -hmm. So I think, like I said, I, there, he has a lot of flaws and, and I, I don't think the, the situation he's in is um, totally distinct or, or separate from his flaws, but it's not because of his flaws either, if that makes sense, because there are many outside forces, um, including, you know, cultural shifts, like all of this happened at the height of Me Too, like there's, mm -hmm. there's a number mm -hmm. of, of reasons, but there were also people close to him who used that trust um, against him and against the entire organization, so. Okay, and uh, I guess finally, my final question is, uh, why have why have you decided to take this up? I mean, I know I know you're in the midst of a lawsuit and stuff, but why have you decided to take this up as a cause and to to do interviews and to speak out um, about this? Um, what's your motivation? Well, this experience has been the most challenging and humbling and enlightening uh, experience I've ever. Had I never thought I'd be put in such a position to really test my values, my willingness to stand up for things in the face of tremendous adversity. And to be honest, I, I, have, I have nothing to gain by putting myself out there in this way, except for knowing in my heart that I did everything I could to bring out the truth and to help people that I know are not the characters that they've been portrayed in the media and are certainly not, do not belong in prison. And I hope that people, whether they agree with anything I've said about the organization or Keith or personal choices I may have made, that they look at the case and the legal advances that were made with no evidence and how the government was able to basically put on a, a show trial where there's so much prejudice and hate and like, like you don't even know what's needed for the charges, but you know, he's a bad guy because all these women are saying it. Um, that that's not okay. That puts everyone at risk. If, especially puts men at risk. Um, and I think it's our responsibility, you know, we the people, if you will, to, to do something because the government is not going to, like, they're not going to change. It's the citizens who have to stand up and say, this is not okay. Even in the case of the most hated man, and I might disagree with everything he stands for, but he deserves to have rights. Thanks. I really appreciate you joining us. And I, you know, I wish you luck with your life and may things turn out as they should. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everybody. Interviews like the one you've just seen require a lot of time, background research, networking, and then, of course, just effort to put the video together itself. And controversial interviews like the one I just did are especially difficult uh, these days uh, with cancel culture being what it is. And of course, YouTube's ever-changing and ever more strict demonetization policies. So I appreciate your open mind and I appreciate your support. And if you'd like to see more interesting or controversial interviews like this, uh, tips are appreciated. Links are below. Thank you.